Jill, let's call the meeting to order. And let's have a roll call, please. Okay. Richard Hunt. Here. Tom Molson. Here. Laura Nickerson. Here. Eric Rivero Montez. Here. Josh Rosa. Mark White. Shelby Witherby. We do not have a quorum. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Um, normally we have a opportunity to introduce commissioners, but since we have no public members tonight, I think we'll skip that item. And also the next gen item, which is the opportunity for public comment uh, with no uh, uh, public members. I do see a Stephanie B available. Is Stephanie, are you from the public and make, wish to make a comment? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm a member of the public, but um, I don't have a comment today. Just joining to see what the commission's all about. Okay. Well, then maybe we should do an introduction of commissioners. Uh, maybe uh, start with you, Eric, and maybe we can go from uh, left to right on my screen here. Then. Sure. Uh, Eric Rivera Montes. I'm a representative for the city of Elk Grove. Um, I'm currently employed with SMUD, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, and I'm uh, working in the Environmental Services Group, focusing primarily on climate change and greenhouse gas reporting. Tom, are you next? Uh, I'm Tom Mawson. I'm the uh, representative for Folsom Island and Galt. Uh, I've been on the commission before, and now I'm on it again. In the meantime, I've also been a planning commissioner for the city of Galt and a city council member for the city of Galt. Currently retired from Aerojet. Okay. How about you, Laura? Yes, my name is Laura Nickerson. I'm a commissioner appointee from Sac County, and I'm a registered nurse by trade. And, but I would say my passion and my hobby is the rescue and rehabilitation of wildlife and the saving of open wild spaces. Okay. And uh, I'm Richard Hunt. I was appointed by Sacramento County and I've been a consulting environmental planner uh, dealing with water resources and environmental compliance. Uh, Marie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, Marie Wooden, Director for Sacramento County Environmental Management Department. My role is um, to serve as staff to the commission. And I see Shelby's joined us and Shelby, maybe you can introduce yourself as soon as you unmute yourself. Yes, absolutely. Hi everyone, my name is Shelby Witherby and I'm a water resource control engineer with the State Water Resources Control Board, part of the Sacramento County Environmental Commission. Okay, thank you guys. Um, moving ahead, we have uh, two presentations tonight. The first being, uh, uh, discussion of the invasive, spe invasive species program. And with us, we have Martha Volkoff and Thomas Jensen uh, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And Thomas is going to uh, give us a presentation. And so uh, why don't we just take it from there and Thomas, go ahead and uh, uh, share your screen and let's go ahead. Good deal, thank you. Alrighty, can you guys see it okay? Yeah, it looks good. Awesome. Well, I wanted to thank you guys for having me today. Uh, my name is Thomas Jensen. I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in the Invasive Species Program as an environmental scientist. And I'll be talking about some of the things we do in the program and some, uh, some of our current projects we do managing invasive species in the Northern California area. A brief outline of the presentation, I'll talk about our uh, program's mission, our role within the department, some of our invasive species management examples in the Sacramento area, um, some outreach and education materials that we provide and references and resources so that if any of this stuff is interesting to you and you wanna look up more information, you'll have those available. So the mission of the invasive species program is to reduce the negative effects of non-native invasive species on the wildlands and waterways of California. And we define invasive species as non-native to the environment and once established cause harm to the environment, economy, or human health. And so to carry out our mission, we work to prevent introductions of invasive species, 
reduce the effects uh, invasive species have on the environment um, and prevent the spread of invasive species. We work with animals and plants, uh, both aquatic and terrestrial species. And you'll see on the right hand side, uh, this is a nice chart that I think illustrates the stages of biological invasion really well. Um, on, the, on the left side of the chart, you'll see how a species comes to uh, establish and dominate an environment. So an invasive species arrives um, uh, from an external source in an area. Um, over time, we'll establish in that space, uh, begin to reproduce and spread, um, expanding its population. And once it does that, it will start displa displacing native species. And lastly, um, their dominance becomes so big that they begin to dominate the ecosystem. And on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, different types of management strategies we can uh, implement to kind of curb uh, at each stage of the bio biological invasion portion there. So before arrival, uh, prevention is a great first step to you know uh, pre uh, preventing any invasive species from establishing in an area. Once they're established um, in small populations, you can uh, perform an eradication project uh, if it's feasible. After they begin to start to reproduce and spread, um, containing those isolated populations is, is a management strategy. And then once they begin to re reproduce and spread, to start uh, displacing native species, um, really controlling those populations and the effects felt on the environment at that point. And lastly, when they dominate the ecosystem, you really just try to maintain um, those populations and not let them uh, spread to new areas. And I won't spend too much time here on this chart, but I thought it illustrated uh, the time from introduction of an invasive species to the control cost of different management efforts. So um, at the very beginning, uh, you know, prevention costs are very low. Um, and then as the uh, introduction moves on of an invasive species, as they're detected, um, eradication could be feasible, but at a higher cost. And then as those populations begin to grow and expand, um, those control costs increase immensely. So all this to say that an ounce of prevention is certainly worth a pound of cure. And our role as the Invasive Species Program, we have many projects that deal with prevention, eradication, control, and containment. Our program is centered at the CDFW headquarters in West Sacramento, but we also have program staff in the different regions throughout California. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife has split up California into, into different geographic regions, uh, six different regions, and we have scientists in all of those regions monitoring um, and working on invasive species projects. We also work with different programs within the department, as well as other state agencies and stakeholders in invasive, in invasive species. And we provide uh, a number of resources for the public and for people interested in invasive species and support ecosystem scale conservation. So as we move through some of our projects here, I'm gonna highlight uh, some species and, and what we're doing right now. You'll see some common themes uh, as to the impacts of invasive species. And those are that they can prey on native species, outcompete native species, spread disease and pathogens and cause economic problems associated with establishment. And these single species can have ecosystem level impacts and are an added stressor to other effects on our California landscape like climate change. So by far our largest project with our program is the Quagga Zebra Muscle Monitoring Program. And our goal here is to uh, stop the introduction of mussels into the state of California 
doing that by intercepting and uh, decontaminating contaminated watercraft that try to enter the state at some of the 16 border locations throughout the state of California. Um, contaminated watercraft that attempt to enter the state are stopped at the border and decontaminated. Um, the regional scientists are notified and take care of those vessels. We also assist water managers uh, with prevention programs for uninfested waters and control plans for infested waters. We conduct early detection and monitoring surveys at water bodies throughout the state, uh, all four guaga and zebra mussels, as well as other invasive species. And lastly, um, we aim to ed educate the public on this issue as a, it's not only an issue for California, but the United States at large, um, muscle spreading between water bodies is a huge uh, invasive species issue. So part of our statewide early detection for our mussel program, they were first found in Lake Mead in 2000, quag mussels were first found in Lake Mead in 2007, and zebra mussels in San Luis Reservoir in 2008. Our regional scientists conduct statewide early detection monitoring, which includes several different survey types. The first being uh, surface surveys of water bodies. They'll go to a water body and inspect the boat ramp and uh, rocks on the shore and things that the mussels can attach themselves to. Secondly, the scientists can deploy an artificial substrate. As you'll see in the middle picture there, it's a kind of a man-made structure and the mussels, they'll deploy it in a water body for a certain amount of time, and the mussels will begin to grow on that if they are, in fact, in the water body. And lastly, they'll conduct plankton toes, as you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner there, uh, collect water samples and submit those to Bodega Fish Health Lab for analysis of uh, mussel villagers. So conducting this statewide monitoring is really important because it's just as important to know where the mussels are as where they aren't. Um, and determining that presence can allow us early containment uh, or early containment to be initiated, thereby preventing other inv invasive species to be unknowingly transported from location to location. So, we don't have enough staff to check every water body in California, which is why the public plays an important role in keeping an eye out for invasive species and if they find suspect mussels, reporting that to us. So I'll move on to some of our eradic current eradication projects. The first one, our Nerodia eradication project takes place in Roseville and Folsom, there are two separate populations of these invasive water snakes. And they prey on native species, uh, have the potential to outcompete the federal and threatened, federal and state listed um, giant garter snake. And they were likely introduced from pet owner releases. Many times pet owners will get um, some exotic species that are not native to an area and if, if they decide they don't want them anymore due to a number of factors, um, instead of uh, getting rid of them or, or you know, contacting the appropriate entity, um, they'll let them go in the wild and create breeding populations of, of, in this case, an invasive species. And in Roseville, we've been trapping these snakes since 2015 and have removed 110 total snakes. And in Folsom, we started trapping in 2017 and have removed 91 total snakes. And our, our work on this project includes surveying uh, water bodies for habitat, deploying traps, as you see in the picture there is um, plastic minnow traps from June to October, which is their breeding and active season. And lastly, collecting data on these snakes to determine uh, population estimation and monitoring. We collaborate with another CDFW program, the Wildlife Investigations Laboratory. 
to sample the snakes for snake fungal disease, which is a deadly disease that was just found in deadly disease for uh, many snake populations that was just found in California last year. We also collaborate with UC Davis to determine, uh, to help determine population estimation and monitoring of the two snake populations. Next is the Nutria Eradication Project, which if you guys, if anyone watches the news, I'm sure you've heard of around the Sacramento area. They're large semi-aquatic rodents. Uh, they were first discovered in California in 2018. And since then, CDFW and partners have removed 2,251 California. This eradication project is actually run by a separate CDFW program, uh, but is a current eradication project, project uh, with the department. And it's kind of a high profile species with a lot of media attention which is nice um, because it, it allows an opportunity to educate the public on this issue. They can cause devastating impacts uh, to the California landscape by damaging wetland habitats, um, uh, tearing up agricultural plots, and burrowing and flood protection infrastructure, essentially weakening that infrastructure. The New Zealand mud snail uh, surveys is a good example of containing uh, population. New Zealand mud snails are tiny, very tiny snails that form dense colonies uh, in rivers and creeks. Some of these high public use areas where a lot of people go fishing or maybe it's a busy swimming hole. And they have the, and they displace native species. Uh, they, they're so tiny, they, you know, can latch on to boot crevices and, and swimming suits and anywhere where a, a small rock could be trapped, really. And so that's why decontamination um, to stop the spread of their population is so crucial. One snail, one female snail can be responsible for a million young in a year. And they form these dense mats, so dense they could be up to 750,000 snails per square meter which is a lot of snails. So certainly stopping the spread of New Zealand mud snails. And one excellent way to get an understanding of where these populations are is by public sighting reports. Um, they're extremely useful and appreciated uh, towards this project. We've had several public sighting reports come in on New Zealand mud snails, of new populations of mud snails that we weren't aware of. And lastly, uh, populations that we're trying to control at this point that have uh, spread and been, been distributed throughout the state of California. The red-eared slider is very common and American bullfrogs. Both of these are invasive species that live in fresh water and prey on and out uh, some of our native species. They also have the potential to spread disease and pathogens to native populations. While large scale eradication isn't feasible for these species, uh, we are currently working on developing localized control measures and, guide, and a guidance document for landowners. So for example, if someone had a pond on their property where they wanted to eradicate American bullfrogs, uh, just from that pond, we would, they could reference this guidance document that we're working on um, in order to implement some measures to get the bullfrogs out of there and help support the native frog population. And it's not about, all about animals with us. I wanted to highlight another species that uh, we're not currently working to control, but it's highly invasive. And if you spend any time around Folsom, uh, Lake Natoma or the Delta, you likely see this plant. Water hyacinth is a floating aquatic plant from South America and is extremely detrimental to water habitats in this area. Not only can it clog waterways, but it also degrades habitat for waterfowl, can make the water unfit for drinking when the plant decomposes, alters the water chemistry, displace, and displaces native aquatic plants used for food and shelter by other wildlife species. And 
there are some ways to control this plant, but certainly they come with cons as well. Uh, one control method is uh, physical, so hand removal or dredging of, uh, of a wetland area, um, setting up containment barriers uh, to stop the spread of the plant. You'll see on the bottom right hand picture there, um, that's, a, that's like a dense, if it wasn't for that hyacinth, that would be open water. It's formed a dense mat on top of that water and um, uh, completely blocked out anything else that would be able to live there. Another control measure could be biological. There's been, it's been shown that three species of insects, and one species of fungus um, can control hyacinth growth, but most animals don't feed on hyacinth due to the leaves being 95% water and, uh, and then having a high tannin content. And lastly, there's chemical methods which have been proven effective, but they have to be appropriate for the area because you don't want to um, hurt native plants or species uh, by applying chemicals in the area. And lastly, as new invasive species, threats continue to pop up. Um, we, assess, we like to gain information on those uh, to help inform appropriate responses. And one of those is uh, butte swans. These are around Sacramento as well. And they're native to Europe and Asia and introduced for ornamental purposes, um, but certainly are uh, aggressive towards native waterfowl, they have the, they displace native nesting waterfowl and also degrade aquatic habitats by consuming large amounts of submerged aquatic vegetation, which is vegetation that native fish uh, depend on for food and shelter. And while they're certainly a beautiful bird with their, their orange bill and the black bulbous knob on top, um, it can be damaging to the environment. So we receive a lot of public sighting reports on these birds, and it's really appreciated to help us determine the population, the different populations of the birds throughout the state. And we're actively working uh, to assess the impacts of mute swans and considering the appropriate manage management action for them. Outreach and education is a big part of our program as well. Uh, we attend workshop, we hold workshops and attend events to educate the public on uh, safe boating practices and cleaning and draining, drying their boat appropriately uh, to stop the spread of mussels as well as other invasive species. We send out uh, an invasive species newsletter, which is uh, pretty fun. It's got fun content, but also informative information that uh, can help the general, you know, educate the general public on invasive species issues. We have an email subscriber uh, listserv that we send news updates out on. And every year we host uh, the California Invasive Species Action Week. And this year it will be from June 5th to June 13th. And this is a week where we work, uh, we, we historically hold some events in person and work with stakeholders to host some events. Um, one fun one being the youth art contest, uh, which is where youth in middle school and high school submit uh, artwork based on a theme for the week. And uh, uh, we vote for the best one and they get a prize. And it's really fun. It's really great to see. It's fun to see what these kids come up with. Yeah. and. Due to COVID, uh, last year we held virtual activities and I think we'll be doing some of the same this year, but I highly encourage everybody to check that out because it is a lot of fun. And lastly, um, we do have education and training uh, information on our website uh, for boat inspections, instructional video, and EdMaps directions, which is our invasive species reporting application. Lastly, some references and resources. Our website is up at the top there for anything you wanna look up invasive species related. I encourage you to subscribe for updates and announcements 
um, to our listserv and newsletter. Those are both really fun. On the website, you can view species profiles and read more about other invasive species in this area, uh, as well as, as look up some of the project information that I discussed here. And lastly, I wanna encourage everybody to report invasive species sightings. Um, and there's multiple ways you can do that. Uh, you can fill out an online form on our website. You can email uh, our email, which is listed there, invasives at wildlife.ca.gov. Uh, call our invasive species hotline or submit the um, sighting report to our smartphone application EdMaps. Um, this is a newly developed application that California was just added to to keep track of invasive species reports submitted by the public. Um, yeah, and I would like to uh, say we also have some current job openings in the coming months. So if this information interests anybody, uh, keep an eye out for those. And thank you so much for having me. And I'll, I'll field any questions at this time. Thanks, Thomas. That was a, a good informative presentation. Uh, helps us get a good understanding of what's going on. Uh, I'd like to open us up to any of the commissioners who'd like to uh, offer any questions to uh, Thomas. Uh, Laura? Uh, yes. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I, I have a question about um, like what, this might be too long of an answer. What, what has to get to the bar to get your attention to want to eradicate and or control? I mean, like what are the endpoints? For instance, like European starling, you hear all the time, they're invasive, they're invasive, but I don't think you have any, you know, eradication or control programs for that. So what, what, what brings you to that point? What are the data marks? Yeah, that's a great question. I think part of that is available resources to address the problem and how feasible it is to carry out those projects. Um, so a lot of the survey projects, um, you know, we, we count on some public input on where those populations of invasive species are. A lot of our work is centered around the quagga and zebra uh, muscle prevention because we get um, a lot of our funding uh, for that specifically. And then um, aside from that, you know, there's other ways to get funding for certain projects. And, and part of it is just about resource availability and personnel availability and, uh, you know, taking on projects that um, uh, we could carry out with the personnel we have. Any other questions, Laura? No, no, that no, that's good. So it kind of just sounds like you have to have directions and funding as well as import uh, kind of all come together. Yeah, yeah. And I could kind of field this to Martha as well if she wants to chime in. Uh, Martha Volkoff is our program manager in, here today. Sure. So there is not really a defined formula, as you can imagine. Um, and it, it really, I would have to say the bar is really high for what there will be a large scale response to. And that is around really the impacts uh, of any given species. And as Thomas mentioned, kind of also the prevailing um, space around us at that time in terms of what does funding look like? So for example, um, the two projects that the department and the state of California really have invested in are quagga and zebra mussels from back in 2007, because they were um, a known invader that had significant impacts on water conveyances. And in California, um, you're all well aware that we are highly dependent on um, a very complicated water conveyance system uh, to support throughout the state. Um, and also it had um, a predictably high impact on recreation. 
So those two things, but I, I will say the water conveyance implications really uh, pressed the investment in that program. And the other one that we have um, have high investment is, is the Nutria Eradication Project. Again, Nutria threatened the water conveyance system of the state um, and the wetlands, but I will say the primary driver is economy and human safety, you know, flood security as well. More so than environmental impacts, you know, I, I dare say, but, but those impacts to the state's economy um, really are what drive the response. So we get reports of non-native, potentially invasive species that don't rise to that level um, and that we can't we can't take that scale of an action on. Um, and then there's others, for example, the Nerodia water snake projects that we can take action on on a much smaller scale because they're smaller uh, footprint, smaller scope. Um, but again, another point that Thomas made was also the potential for a positive outcome of, from the efforts and relative to quag and zebra mussels even um, slowing down the spread has a huge economic benefit to the state of California. So it's worth, air quotes, worth investing in um, heavily. Okay. So I hope, I hope that helps outline um, kind of uh, how that decision is made. And it's not made necessarily by our program. Um, it goes through much, um, you know, consideration through the department, but we certainly are involved in um, providing the information and the substantiation and making recommendations. Great, that, cl that clarifies it. Thank you. Sure. Eric, you have a question? Yeah, actually, um, I was curious. How do you have a, a list, and if so, how how many species are on that list of of potential uh, non-native invasive species that we might be facing? And then, second part of that question is: Do you, do you anticipate that getting any worse with more people traveling and climate change? Um, do you have any sense of what that might look like in the future? You want to take that, Thomas, or you want me to take a first stab at it? Yeah, I, yeah. I would, I would say um, it's, well, we have a global economy. And one very recent example of that is um, the beginning of March, we got an email that um, these aquarium moss balls, which are a little ornamental clump of algae, uh, that are popular in the pet stores. They sell them in little cups like Beta. They sell cups of with moss balls in them for like $10. Well, um, these moss balls had been imported into the United States with zebra mussels on them. So that came into California to a distributor to uh, PetSmart and Petco, a national uh, distributor, and so they repackaged them, sent those out nationwide. So it, something Thomas didn't talk about is sort of the vectors and how these invasive species are coming. But with our global economy, that was a national distributor or a chain, but these are also coming in by private individuals purchasing online, where now today we can order directly from all over the world, which really opens up some scary possibilities for invasive species. So maybe they're plant pests in furniture, you know, that comes in or um, yard decorations that aren't essentially treated to kill insects in them. So potentially we have a lot of international commodities coming into the US. Um, in terms of is, well, I would say, yes, that's more than it was certainly a hundred years ago. And that has ramped up over time. Um, and I'll, I'll say climate change may be opening up some more possibilities to that. 
um, from one hand by um, making it tougher for our native species to survive and thereby opening the door for some of these non-natives and also creating something these non-natives tend to have in common is they're more flexible in the environment that they can live in. So it sort of opens the door a little wider for them to uh, do well relative to our natives. Anything you wanna to add to that, Thomas? No, I, I think that was good. Um, in terms of a master list, I think there's, uh, in terms of a master list for California of, of invasive species, um, I think there are some high profile species that we keep an eye on, but um, there, there can be a lot of non-native species introduced and uh, what could be an issue for California may not be an issue for Oregon or Arizona. And so a lot of these states are facing, um, they're facing similar invasive species issues like the muscle management, but at the same time, I think there are some species that are on our radar that may not be on theirs. And same for East Coast, for West Coast, as for example, these water snakes are uh, native to the East Coast. So it's, you know, correct for them to be over there. To, but, uh, but over here, it's an issue for us. And one suite of species that's high on my list of concern are Asian carp. Sorry, that's my cat. Asian carp, which we don't have in the West, um, but they would pose a significant threat to our um, river species and native salmonids. Um, and they're really um, a ch challenge. I mean, it, they can't just get here, right? They will take a human mediated pathway to get here, but the potential I think exists out there that that they can make it over here uh, and the consequences of them being introduced and established in California, I think is really high. What can we do to prevent that? Um, I look to our border protection stations and the goodwill of the citizens of California to prevent that from happening. Um, but, but that's a really, um, I'm really worried about that, to be honest. Well, thank you for the response. Uh, great, great presentation, and I really appreciated um, you sharing the uh, the way that the public can can participate if we do spot one of these non non native species. Um, I have a few questions, you guys. Um, are there any laws or regulations that prohibit the importation of these species or release of the species to the environment? Absolutely. Um, there, we California and the California Code of Regulations has a list of restricted species that cannot be uh, possessed, imported, or transported in the state. Um, and so, a number of the invasive species are on that list. Mm -hmm. So, in the case of where the uh, zebra mussels were released along with the moss. Does the Petco's companies of the world have any liability for allowing that release to occur? Um, well, I'll say it is an ongoing law enforcement investigation. I don't foresee, um, they were just an unfortunate player in that. Um, and that we really, our program works and our department works um, on it. and educational sort of angle primarily um, and reserves enforcement for sort of willful um, actions. So I would say, I mean, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is involved because it was an international importation. And I don't know that they will be pursuing legal remedies. I think the, the greater um, value is figuring out how that breach happened and finding ways to better address that in the future. Um, yeah. 
I know a, a circumstance, uh, I think it was maybe 10 or 12 years ago, where uh, I guess pike was introduced to a lake up in Northern California. And your department went to heroic efforts to uh, try to eradicate it from the lake so that it wouldn't uh, migrate into the Central Valley. And uh, I, I assume you were fairly successful with that effort. Do you, do you recall that program? Yeah, so there were actually two eradication. Well, there was actually a, a second lake, but in the lake you're, I think, referring to that was in about 2006 or seven, the second eradication effort there was Lake Davis. Yeah. So, so yes. Um, so the first, after the first treatment, um, and that was a chemical treatment. Both were chemical treatments. It's really the only uh, method available for that scale of a eradication effort. Um, there, pike uh, were found there again. How they, whether they were missed or reintroduced, you know, we'll never know. Um, but that second effort, I think, worked far more closely with the community to try to get buy-in than we did on the first. Um, and that was, um, so I think we had a more successful implementation effort. Um, and so yes, no pike have been detected since then. So that has been a success. Yeah, good. Um, in the case of the water hyacinth, um, do you guys, is, is, does the Department of Boating and Waterways actively contr uh, control that down in the Delta II, or is that a separate action that they're taking there? That is the um, Division of Boating and Waterway. So in California state governance, they have the authority to treat aquatic weeds in the Delta. So Sacramento County touches in on the Delta. Um, so they are the agency that does those treatments. Okay, so you coordinate with them in, in regards to managing that, the highest effort. Yeah, really, we don't, we aren't directly involved. Obviously, there are colleagues, um, and they also have staff who work on a Quagga Zebra Mussel Prevention Grant Program. So we do work with their program and staff fairly closely, but we're not directly involved in um, the the Delta weed management. Okay. We may do a little bit of uh, aquatic weed management on our own Department of Fish and Wildlife properties, uh, again, um, as necessary, but nowhere near the scale that Division of Boating and Water was. Waterway does to treat aquatic weeds throughout the Delta. Okay. Um, in regards to the nutria eradication, is the public allowed to take nutria? or is that only conducted by uh, department staff? Property owners or their agents may take Nutria. So there are no prohibitions against taking Nutria. And the uh, regulations that Thomas mentioned, um, Nutria are a restricted species, so you cannot possess them live, but you can possess them dead, essentially, as well as take them. So it's not a species that um, we are promoting hunting on or encouraging um, the take by the public. However, property owners um, to protect their property and also, you know, frankly, to help with the, the cause, um, they do take them. Um, so. Okay. And I guess my last question is, does the... Uh... Department of Fish and Wildlife take, I wouldn't say take, but uh, receive unwanted pets that people don't want, or do you just, is that up to the county animal control to, to take those kind of uh, situations? We don't take animals. Um, if it were a restricted species, so say somebody, um, surrendered a nutria, or this is an actual example, um, a SPCA in one of the coastal counties came into possession of a mute swan, which mute swans are restricted. 
Um, they contacted us asking what they should do with it um, or if we had a um, sort of recommendation what to do with it. So we helped direct them to an appropriate person who would be permitted um, to take possession of it. But we do not have a program. I've been interested in my time in our programs. I've been with the Invasive Species Program for 13 years now, um, implementing some sort of surrender project for restricted species. So for non-restricted species like red-eared sliders, we do try to connect folks with um, either pet shops or we try to direct them to rehome them on their own just because of the capacity. I mean, there's probably thousands of red-eared sliders. Uh, people pick them up crossing the street, you know, and then they say, what do I do with this thing? Um, because they don't really want to keep it, but they don't want to see it injured or killed in the street. Um, so we try to direct them to um, either the animal welfare groups, SPCA, county, um, animal control, or reptile uh, associations who might be able to assist with rehoming them. For But the restricted species are a different sort of uh, situation where unless you have a permit issued by the department, you would not be allowed or legally allowed to possess those species. So um, in those, we do our best to line up and often our law enforcement division gets involved because they have typically more connections around that. Um, but, but so I was sorry to diverge, but um, in Florida, they have pet amnesty days where people are able to surrender uh, restricted or non-restricted species, um, which I think is a good idea. If folks have something that they can't keep, I would prefer to uh, allow them to surrender them so that we get them out of the environment, get them out of the pet trade um, and see if we can find a zoo or some other facility mm -hmm. uh, where those animals can go. So but I mean, as uh, yet, we haven't, haven't been able to do that. It's like in Florida, if you have a pet python you want to get rid of, you shouldn't throw it out in the lake or something. Right, yeah, that's exactly what we'd like to avoid happening. Yeah. Any other questions from the commission? Well, guys, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very informative and uh, uh, you had me engaged through this whole time. So I uh, appreciate it. I think we'll wrap it up and uh, move on to our next agenda item. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. And Jill has the presentation and my contact information um, if you guys have any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Um, our next agenda item is um, from the Sacramento Yellow Mosquito and Vector Control District, Gary Goodman. And Gary is uh, uh, a annual uh, presentation he gives us to this time of year because of the onset of warmer weather and uh, uh, people being outdoors and lots of standing water around at the, as a result of the uh, winter rains, or in this case, the lack of winter rains. Uh, maybe Gary, you can, you can uh, uh, comment on the uh, any differences you see this year uh, in regards to comparing the last year events in terms of uh, mosquito populations in the area. So go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope you guys can hear me and see the screen. So uh, thank you again for the invitation to come out and talk with the commission. Uh, um, actually, I'm going to do a little bit of dovetailing with what Thomas just talked about in terms of invasive species because we have some from the mosquito control world as well. But um, but yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our district, what we do, uh, what we're anticipating for this upcoming season, and some of the things that we're working on. Um, so just a little bit of background uh, for folks. You know, the uh, Mosquito Abatement Act was enacted in 1915 by the California legislature. And essentially, this was to try to help get rid of malaria um, in California and also to uh, help the economy. Uh, people didn't want to buy houses where there were just tons of mosquitoes. And so 
Uh, they put together the Mosquito Abatement Act. So it's been in the California Health and Safety Code for over 100 years. Um, and the, the first district was formed actually in Placer County. Um, and uh, you see some of the, the photos there of, of trying to uh, move water and, and uh, essentially mosquitoes breed in standing water or stagnant water. And so a lot of effort was made back in the day to be able to try to help boost the economy by, um, by allowing or reducing mosquito production um, throughout the state of California. Um, our district specifically, uh, Sacramento, we cover both Sacramento and Yolo County. We were established in 1946. So this is our 75th anniversary of being uh, a part of the community. Um, we're a special district. Uh, so we're funded specifically by tax uh, property taxes. So for every, um, I think, thousand dollars of property tax that you pay to the county, we get seven dollars or something, something like that. Um, we are governed by a board of uh, 13 trustees, each appointed by uh, all of the incorporated cities that are within Sacramento and Yolo County, and then one um, at-large county um, for each Sacramento and Yolo County. And so we have about 65 full-time employees. It's actually now 68. Um, and then we hire about 25 or so seasonal employees to help us through what we call the mosquito season between April and October. And so our goal is protect public health, um, provide safe, effective, economical mosquito and vector control. Um, uh, our authority is under the California Health and Safety Code uh, specifically. And so it's not uh, initially, again, when the Mosquito Abatement Act was enacted, it was to help control disease like malaria. Uh, then once we were able to eradicate malaria, um, then we didn't really have a lot of disease. We had some um, some, I'll say some minor diseases, Western equine encephalomyelitis or St. Louis encephalitis, those types of things that were transmitted by mosquitoes, uh, dog heartworms transmitted by mosquitoes as well, but not uh, large threats that we had up until we saw the introduction of West Nile virus. And that became the most prevalent uh, mosquito borne disease that we've had in California. Um, we work very closely with the California Department of Public Health. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, at our office in El Grove, we actually have a satellite office for CDPH. And so we work very closely with CDPH, with UC. Um, it's nice to have UC Davis and entomology school right in our backyard. And we work uh, very collaboratively with them. And of course, other agencies like CDC. So again, our district, uh, Sacramento and Yolo County, about one and a half million residents in Sacramento County. Uh, about 300,000 in Yolo County. And we're very diverse from the perspective of we have agriculture in terms of uh, rice fields, wetlands, those types of things, and then a huge population center with Sacramento. If you think about Sacramento County from essentially from Elk Grove all the way up to uh, out to Folsom and Roseville, it's all just for the most part concrete. So, um, and then right outside of that, you have a lot of uh, agriculture and, uh, and wetland areas so that, have, that can produce mosquitoes. And of course, mosquitoes don't exactly uh, uh, follow borders. So uh, they'll fly and, and they can infect uh, the areas where people are populating. Uh, so our district is broken up into various zones. And essentially we have an employee that works in each one of these zones and their job every day is to go out and look for mosquito breeding sources. So um, anywhere from backyard swimming pools to rice fields or irrigation ditches, wetlands, um, and respond to service requests from the public. So the public calls and says, hey, I'm being bothered by mosquitoes. Um, we send a technician out to kind of investigate what that is. Another large challenge that we have are the storm drains. Uh, so all of the sewer lines, they're not sewer lines, but storm lines that are in the streets, uh, people water their grass, it uh, collects in those things, and those storm drains are designed to hold water. Well, it's perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. So uh, we treat over 200,000 storm drains in Sacramento and, and Yolo County per year. So it's a very extensive project that we have uh, just dealing with those storm drains, um, things that people don't even think about or see. So in California, there are about 53 different mosquito species. Um, within our district here, we have about 24 of those species. And so not every mosquito species uh, transmits disease. Um, all mosquito species bite. Uh, the female mosquitoes are the ones that, that bite. The male mosquitoes only feed on nectar. Um, and they have different types of habitat and, uh, and preferences. So there's some mosquitoes that just feed on birds, some mosquitoes feed on mammals. Um, some mosquitoes feed on, on snakes or lizards, those types of things. And so they really do have a preference. Um, and of course, for us, we have mosquitoes kind of year round here in Sacramento County, uh, just because of the weather. Um, however, their most active period really is from May through October. As the weather starts to warm up, the mosquitoes become more active. 
So the mosquito goes through a full metamorphosis. Um, you can see uh, in some of the pictures there, the eggs that are in the upper left-hand corner, those are egg rafts. And so that's about, you can see a little bit more um, in the bottom there. Um, you can see the, the eggs look like a small raft. That's how they lay them. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive if you actually get to see it um, live. I, I guess maybe, I, I, I guess we, I get excited about that. But um, so then they go through egg, uh, so it looks like just little small specks of dust, but essentially those are all about 150 eggs uh, tied together in a raft. Uh, then they go through four larval stages in the water, go through a pupil stage, and then they'll emerge as an adult. So the focus of what we try to do is uh, get them in their aquatic stage before they become adults. Um, and so that's why we're always looking for stagnant standing water out in, um, in the environment. So here's a great picture of a mosquito laying eggs uh, on the water in that kind of raft in a vertical raft type thing. Uh, they're initially uh, white when they're first laid and then they kind of lighten, uh, go to a, a light brown. Um, and they're just about one millimeter long. Um, so it's very hard to see. A lot of people just think it's just floating debris in, in water. So they're not even paying attention. Um, and that's one of the challenges I think that we have is trying to engage the public as to what to look for uh, in their own backyard so that they can make sure that they're not breeding mosquitoes uh, on their own property. So it uh, depends on the different species they have as to kind of what their life cycle is. So from egg to adult for certain species like uh, what we call floodwater species, and these are mosquitoes that typically lay their eggs in mud. So not necessarily on the water in a raft, um, different species lay their eggs in kind of a different environment, but um, floodwater species lay their eggs in mud. And then essentially they wait for uh, a flood event like, uh, like a farmer just you know, uh, saturating the field. Um, and then that triggers the mosquito to start to hatch. And that takes about three to five days for those species. Um, those 80 species tend to really like mammals and like people. So when an 80s, uh, when we call a pasture mosquito comes off, we definitely get phone calls about it because people are people notice um, because they are very aggressive and they like to bite humans. Um, for Culex species, those are the ones that, that kind of lay uh, in standing water. That takes about seven to 10 days. Um, and then for rice field mosquitoes, uh, like Anopheles, which transmit, can transmit malaria, that takes a little bit longer, 14 to 21 days. So it's really just dependent on time of the year, time of the temperature of the water, uh, those types of things, and the, and the different species as to kind of what the, their larval or aquatic uh, stage will be. So again, uh, a lot of different mosquito habitats. These are ones that are easy for us to spot. These are wetlands or rice fields, um, you know, uh, uh, swamps, or I don't want to say swamps, but the, uh, the conveyance system that the waterways have um, um, that uh, for the stormwater to come through on those collection areas, all of those things that have this vegetation water interface are perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So it's easy for us to spot these things because I can drive right down the road and notice that there's water standing with vegetation. The backyard sources are the more ones that are a bit more difficult for us. Um, backyard swimming pools, obviously buckets, tires, those types of things. Anything that will collect water um, that sits for about a week or so can breed mosquitoes. And so the big challenge for us is being able to try to engage with the public and having them go around and clean their yards to make sure um, that they're just dumping any standing water. So, um, you know, you don't have to get rid of the tire, but if you can just make sure that the tire is not holding water, then it also won't breed mosquitoes. So we take what we call an integrated mosquito management approach. Um, the first of that is public information. We do, uh, up until COVID, we did a lot of public events. Um, we had a lot of school uh, activities that we went out to classrooms and gave presentations, um, neighborhood association meetings, all those types of things. And we're trying to do all of those now virtually, but that's just a, a bit of a different animal at this moment in time. Uh, we're hoping that the you know, schools get back in session, we'll be able to, to pick those back up. And obviously, hopefully with the vaccination effort, we'll be able to try to go out and do um, some live events and engage with the public specifically. But we also have a very active uh, social media campaign, advertising campaign, uh, radio, television, those types of things. We want people to know uh, what they can do to try to help prevent both mosquito breeding and of course, disease transmission. Then we go through the second stage which is what we call surveillance, um, which is uh, actually setting traps throughout the district. So we set traps uh, every day. Uh, throughout the district to just gauge the different species that we find and the abundance. So we want to know if there's a particular problem in Elk Grove or Folsom or downtown Sacramento. Um, are the populations increasing? What species are starting to increase in that particular area? And it allows us to try to help track disease transmission as well. Then we have uh, biological control right in the center of the screen is our mosquito fish. Um, at our facility down in Elk Grove, we have about 23 ponds dedicated towards breeding these small fish. 
Um, we plant these uh, in various places like backyard swimming pools, rice fields, wetlands, those types of things. Um, and they're very good at eating mosquito larvae. Um, and so we probably are the largest mosquito fish breeding facility in the country. Uh, we plant about 3,000 pounds of fish every year uh, just in Sacramento and Yolo County. Uh, then we have an ecological management department, and this one is designed specifically to work with landowners. Uh, and we have some equipment, heavy equipment, uh, both a backhoe, a dump truck, those types of things. And we've worked with landowners like CDFW, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, Consumnus River Preserve, all of those types of kind of large landowners that potentially may be producing mosquitoes on their own property. And we work with them on different mitigation methods that they can do, and we'll provide labor um, if need be. So, And then the last method is, is the chemical control, and that's where we use those uh, products that are targeted specifically towards uh, mosquito larvae that we put in the aquatic stage, uh, but then also when we do get adult mosquitoes and specifically uh, infected adult mosquitoes with disease, uh, then we'll do adult mosquito control efforts. And that's anywhere from backpack to truck uh, to, uh, to airplane, uh, which we've done in the past. And we're actually investigating uh, some of the drone uh, usage uh, for applications of pesticides as well. So again, the public information, really trying to make sure that we're getting the word out to the general public. Um, this is uh, some photos of our laboratory. Uh, we do our own PCR testing for disease transmission within our own facility. Uh, we also have sentinel chickens um, that we have at various places throughout the district um, because chickens are a great sentinel for West Nile virus. Uh, they don't get sick, but, they, uh, but we, uh, we can take a blood sample from the chicken and determine whether it is carrying West Nile. So then we know that we have transmission active in a particular area. Uh, we also do tick surveillance and testing for Lyme disease as well. Uh, so here's just a, a snapshot of where our, our lab surveillance or our trap locations are. And, and for the most part, these are weekly trap locations that we put out throughout the district. So these are things that we collect every week. Uh, this is not the extent of our trapping location. Uh, we trap uh, hundreds of other sites throughout here, mostly dependent on where we find potential disease. So if we get a positive bird, then we will set traps in and around the location where that positive bird was. If we trap a positive mosquito, uh, then again, the same thing, we'll expand our trapping in that particular area. So uh, through the course of a year, we had hundreds of different uh, testing sites uh, where, we, where we set traps to be able to try to collect data from. Um, again, our fisheries program is a picture. We have some indoor tanks uh, where we bring them in and we treat them. Um, but here's a picture uh, on the right-hand side uh, of one of our ponds at our facility in Elk Grove and, and uh, some of our employees seining the ponds to collect the fish so that we can plant them out in the field. Uh, again, here's our ecological management department. Uh, um, we have uh, a lot of different types of equipment. We do a lot of mowing, as you can see in the upper right hand corner. Um, that's helping the landowners be able to try to either gain access to a particular breeding site or just to, to try to clear areas so that water moves more freely and it's not choked off by vegetation. Uh, we also, again, have a backhoe and dump truck where we can help uh, with the landowner um, be able to try to make sure that they're not producing mosquitoes on their own property. And here's a couple of photos of, of some of our drones um, that we've purchased over the last couple of years and started to do work with. Um, and so this is one of those eight copter things. And, and on top of this or, or just underneath, there's a, um, a reservoir that has a, uh, some of the pesticide. And so we can actually fly over this area and apply this pesticide much faster um, and easier than it would take someone to have to walk that entire, um, that entire pond that you see. So a very efficient means and something we're continuing to explore. Uh, this one here has kind of a granular uh, operation. If you kind of zoom or look in closely just underneath it, you'll actually see some of the um, uh, granular, granular uh, uh, material that we're dropping out of that. And so it's just a rotating um, spinner on the bottom of that, but again, allows us to be very efficient and effective with what we're doing. Uh, this is not one that we own. This is one from, uh, it's from Yamaha. Um, and this was a trial that we did last year uh, with a company. Um, so the drones actually get uh, quite a bit bigger um, and start to resemble things that are much more like aircraft. Um, but the technology is definitely emerging and it's something that we want to try to make sure that we're, we're keeping on top of it so that we're being innovative in terms of how we're be able to be more efficient and effective out in the field. Um, again, control operations, uh, as I mentioned, you know, backyard swimming pools, um, there in the, in the bottom middle, the storm drains and, and those types of uh, sites where we might uh, have mosquito uh, um, activity and production. Um, and then the, right there in the middle is the airplane that we have to utilize uh, for treatments that we do in a lot of agricultural areas, specifically over rice fields, um, to help uh, reduce adult mosquito uh, populations. But when we also have to do 
uh, disease transmission over town, that that's the airplane that we would use for that. So, you know, why do we do this and, and, uh, and what's the point? Well, one, uh, uh, mosquitoes can carry disease. Uh, West Nile virus uh, specifically is one that was introduced here into the United States in 1999. Uh, within four years, it steadily made its way across the country. And so it's established here in 2003. Uh, West Nile is a bird disease. So it's actually carried by birds and then vectored by mosquitoes. So a mosquito bites an infected bird, picks up the disease, then bites another bird, passes it on, or it potentially bites a human and passes it on to us. Um, but mosquitoes also carry other uh, diseases uh, that are prevalent uh, throughout the world. Dengue, malaria, chikungunya, Zika virus was a big one that was heard a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and dog heartworm is one that uh, people are not aware of, that we do have the right species of mosquito that can transmit that disease as well. So what's now virus activity in California? Um, Here's a snapshot of the last five years or so. And, and the last three years, we've had pretty low cases. Um, you know, this is all of California. So just a few over 200 cases. Now, uh, granted, what I do wanna try to highlight is the fact that this disease tends to go significantly underreported. So most of these cases that get reported that are shown up here are actually what we call the more serious neuroinvasive form of the disease. This requires hospitalization, can lead to paralysis, blindness, and of course, even death. And so CDC estimates that for every neuroinvasive form of the disease, you have anywhere from 30 to 70 cases that go unreported. And typically this would just be someone who has the flu, who gets the flu, who got bit by a mosquito um, and developed flu-like symptoms and they stayed home. They never went to the doctor, they never got diagnosed. The doctor maybe not, never even tested their blood to see if they were carrying West Nile. So it can be a very serious disease and you really have thousands of people that are um, that are stricken with this disease on an annual basis in California. So we want to try to make sure that people recognize that it's, it's not a minor disease. It can have significant impacts. In fact, um, in its introduction in 2005, um, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, in 2006, CDPH did a study where they followed up with a number of folks that had tested positive for West Nile. And almost 50% of the folks that had West Nile the previous year we're still experiencing some impact from West Nile, whether it be just tiredness or just not feeling right. So you think about, you know, a flu, um, it can be very serious, but if you're still having an impact uh, day to day on your life a year later, that, that's pretty significant. So we wanna make sure that people are aware of that and that there's some basic things that they can do to try to, to, to help. Um, so here's the dovetail with what Thomas was talking about, invasive species of mosquitoes um, found in Sacramento and Yolo County. And so um, this is the 80s Egypti mosquito. It's called the yellow fever mosquito. Um, and this is not native here to California. Uh, obviously, this uh, initially started in, in, in Asia, um, but then steadily made its way to South America, Central America, Mexico, and has now started to establish itself in here in California. And it's not supposed to be here. We do have the species on the East Coast, um, in Florida, Arkansas, uh, uh, in those areas, but in California, we never detected it until about 2004. Um, and so in Sacramento, we discovered it in uh, 2019. So the concern with these particular mosquitoes is that they are very efficient vectors of more exotic diseases like dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Um, and so the challenge that we have is that they're very difficult to control. So as Thomas referenced, you know, the identification of an invasive species immediately is a good start. Um, and then you have to put in measures to be able to try to minimize and eradicate it. But then once it becomes established, it becomes very difficult and very expensive to be able to try to control. And so we're seeing that again in the fact that in Southern California, um, the mosquito has been established uh, there for the past 10 years. And they're having a very difficult time in being able to try to control it. Uh, these particular species of mosquitoes like, like uh, houses and they like people, they like to bite humans um, and they like to live around where people are. And so these are actually sources that we found in people's backyards that were breeding these types of mosquitoes. And so, um, you know, everything from even that in the bottom, in the very middle bottom, that it's a bromeliad plant um, that, collect, that just has a little bit of water in the plant. That's a perfect breeding ground. These mosquitoes love those types of things. So again, the challenge for us is being able to try to see all of this because it's very easy for us to go see a rice field or a wetland, very difficult for me to see in your backyard. And we don't have the resources to be able to go from backyard to backyard to backyard to backyard. So we really rely on the public to be able to let us know whether they're being bothered by mosquitoes so that we can come out and, and take a visit and then look for these types of sources. 
So here's a map of what we found um, in terms of invasive species within uh, for this particular species in Sacramento and Yolo County. Uh, our first detection was in 2019 in that Citrus Heights area on the northern portion of, uh, of Sacramento and Placer County. And in fact, Placer County also found some uh, species on their side of the border as well. Uh, and then last year, we found a large population in winters, which is really unusual for us, and then another one in the Arden Arcade area. Uh, which is uh, unusual for us. And I think as, as Thomas referenced, you know, these invasive species don't just show up here. They, um, and this particular mosquito doesn't fly very far. It only flies about um, maybe about a hundred yards um, in terms of its flight range. Um, so these things are being brought by people and that's, that becomes the challenge. Um, they're, they're not knowingly doing it. And unlike uh, I think some of the, the invasive pets that they have in terms of the snakes and things like that, that people are releasing out in the front, nobody's actively, you know, has a mosquito colony in their yard, um, but they're unknowingly bringing these things, whether they're moving from uh, a place where they're endemic um, and some of the eggs are left on some of the potting plant or material that they're bringing with them, um, and literally to uh, mosquitoes hitching a ride in a car. Um, you know, all of those things are very feasible and possible. Um, how they got here, uh, the story typically was that they were, if anybody remembers Lucky Bamboo, it's a, a plant um, that sits in water um, that was imported from, from Asia and literally on, a, on the slow boat across the Pacific um, and then ended up in the port of Long Beach. Uh, and then uh, those lucky bamboo were sold in stores and they had those mosquito eggs. And so then when people put water in them, then all of a sudden those eggs hatched. Um, so unknowingly actually bringing these and transporting these around. Um, we had a, a situation, the one, the singular dot there that you see kind of or just outside the pocket area of Sacramento was, was actually uh, a, a lady who moved up here, a woman who moved up here and her daughter brought a lucky bamboo plant as a housewarming gift from Southern California. And that lucky bamboo plant had 80s Egypti eggs in the plant. So again, unknowingly, she drove up from Sacramento, uh, bringing her mother a plant and, and essentially brought uh, this species with her. So we do a lot of active door-to-door -door inspections. Um, when we do this, when we do find these species, uh, we come to the house, we'll set traps, we do treatments, um, we'll dump any standing water and really try to educate the residents as to what to look for. Um, so that they can try to help us um, um, minimize the impact of these um, of these particular species. And so we do do localized treatments um, uh, when needed, both adulticide and larvicide when we find those things, uh, because we want to be able to try. We're in the eradication mode uh, at this moment in time. Um, so we've actually established some of these, uh, uh, our surveillance and, and built uh, traps from the ground. Um, so this particular picture um, is a photo of a trap that tracks, uh, tracks these particular species of mosquitoes. And we've actually fitted it with a, a solar panel so that it, it's powered uh, immediately. We can transport these um, anywhere. It's got a, a monitoring, weather monitoring system ramped on top so we can collect data on that. Um, and we pick these traps up uh, on a very frequent basis once we find it in a particular area. Uh, we do do tr uh, treatments and control areas, uh, so um, you can see the truck there is spraying out a larvicide, so this is what we call an ultra low volume uh, larvicide spray, um, and this allows us to find those very cryptic sources that are in people's backyards, and so we can make these treatments. Um, typically, we do them in the middle of the night when nobody is out, um, but we will drive. You can see on the right-hand side, uh, that's the path of where the truck was going, and so we were making treatments so that we could try to get this material into people's backyards. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was very effective. Uh, in, in the Citrus Heights area, we found it in 2019 and all of last year, we didn't find any more in that particular area. It doesn't mean they're gone, it just means they're well below our detection level. Uh, we also do a lot of public outreach when, when we have these invasive species, whether it be press releases or trying to get media coverage and letting people know what the concerns are and what they can do to try to, to help minimize that. Um, and of course, we, you know, we give uh, talks like this. Um, I, if this, this is the time of year we go out to various city councils and I give uh, uh, talks. Normally it's in person, but now it's all Zoom. Uh, just making sure the elected officials know what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and trying to get that information out to the public as a whole. Uh, one thing we're also looking at are some uh, what we call innovative control strategies. Um, and this is specifically a sterile insect technique. Um, so sterile insect technique has been used in um, in various areas, uh, specifically by USDA for screwworm. Uh, it was used for the medfly. 
Um, and so essentially what happens is you sterilize males and specifically, in, and, and so researchers are starting to look at this from a mosquito perspective. So for mosquitoes, what you do is you sterilize males and then you release those males into a neighborhood where you have this invasive species. The sterilized males mate with the female, the wild females, and then the progeny is no good. Um, the nice part about releasing males is the males don't bite. So um, we just have to kind of get over the perception of, of a mosquito control district actually releasing mosquitoes into a neighborhood as opposed to trying to get rid of them. Um, that's a bit of a challenge, but, um, but for the most part, I think when you look at the science of what's there, and so they've been doing some, uh, some work uh, trials in Fresno County, they've done some in Southern California, uh, they've also been doing trials uh, in some of the Caribbean islands in Florida and the Florida Keys, uh, Brazil, um, and show that this method really can crash a population. So, which is a good thing. Um, that means that we don't, uh, we're trying to minimize um, uh, the impact of it. So again, uh, you know, where's it being used? Um, the screw worm, um, uh, Mediterranean fruit, fruit fly uh, are other areas where this uh, sterilization of males um, is has been working from uh, from a USDA standpoint. Um, uh, some places in, in Canada have used it for um, you know other moths things like that. So there's the this is a good established um, uh, science. It's just a matter of now it's being converted kind of over to the mosquito side of it, which is great. Uh, great gives us a few more options available to us. So SIT there's a couple different types. Uh, one is called Wolbachia. Uh, the other is irradiation. So Wolbachia is a, a natural uh, bacteria that's found uh, within some insects. Um, and, um, and what happens is that if you can introduce Wolbachia to the males, and then they, I'll show you here, um, and then they mate with the females, um, then again, the progeny is no good. So if you have uh, the wild mosquitoes, um, we introduce Wolbachia infected male mosquitoes they mate with the uh, Wolbachia less female mosquitoes, then the, the offspring is no good. The challenge is, is that if you get female mosquitoes that do have the Wolbachia and they mate with Wolbachia infected males, you will get um, offspring from that. So the challenge is, is that our mosquitoes currently now uh, uh, do not have Wolbachia or not infected. So there's a, a group out of the University of Kentucky that's actually heading this type of work. Um, and actually Google, um, Verily, is their kind of... Uh, public health arm, um, but funded by Google is actually helping with some of this work as well. Uh, the irradiation, um, you know, simply uh, for the most part, it's, it's a big x-ray machine. And so you got a conveyor belt of male mosquitoes, you put them through an x-ray machine and when they come out the other side, they're, they're sterile and then you can release them out into the, into the wild. So um, it doesn't sound right, but, uh, but the, the process definitely works. So uh, our focus is to try to help uh, look at and explore, and we're, we're working very closely with a lot of these agencies that are starting to develop this SIT mod model and methods. Um, so looking at other methods that might be helpful for us to be able to, because the, the nice part with the SIT method is the fact that it's, it's not pesticide. Um, so we can reduce our pesticide profile from there and still yet control the mosquitoes. And so um, it's really new, exciting uh, research that's being done by a number of different universities across the country. Um, the fact that the SIT technology has been around for, for decades um, and has been very effective in a number of other different uh, 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 insect avenues. Um, we're excited that folks are starting to finally look at this for mosquitoes. Um, we're also doing a lot of different collaborations, um, uh, always looking for research opportunities, um, working with federal, state, local entities. Um, they have uh, what they call CDC funded, um, they call centers of excellence um, and UC Davis and UC Riverside, which are two entomology schools, um, got a grant uh, to be able to try to do more research in the mosquito control area, which is what we need. We need people to look at how to better control mosquitoes so that we have better tools for us uh, when we want it, when we have a, a individual problems. And then AMCA and MBCAC are our, our national and statewide uh, mosquito control association groups. So just briefly, I want to uh, just touch base on uh, the PACVEC Center of Excellence. These are collaborations that we've done at our district with um, various universities throughout um, what they call this PACVEC um, Center of Excellence that's funded by CDC. Um, so we did one uh, project uh, a couple of years ago looking at the uh, fate transport and risk assessment of uh, pesticides um, in rice fields. Um, specifically, we wanted to try to take a look at the impact on potential organic rice 
Um, and so we did a, a project with uh, Dr. Jay Gann, and I believe he just published that work um, last year. And, and the impact is, is the fact that for the most part, our vector control products and specifically adult vector control products, um, adulticides that we spray over rice fields and things like that, um, don't have a whole lot of, uh, don't have accumulation uh, in the environment. And so they degrade very quickly. So they're not found in the rice stock at all um, after treatment, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and so we are continuing to try to do some other exciting work on that. So um, we did some, some trials here with the pesticide residues. Um, and as you can see, just a couple days after treatments, um, our, our products uh, um, were no longer be able to be detected, which is a good thing. That's exactly what we want. We want these products to be useful for the time that we need them to be used and not long lasting and sustaining in the environment. Um, we also have done uh, some catch basin uh, pesticide levels, and, and this was a concern that we have because uh, homeowner use of pesticides. Um, homeowners, for the most part, look at something and say, well, if a little is good, a lot is better. And a lot of times, uh, then they overwater uh, their lawns and, and things like that, and a lot of those pesticides go down into the storm drains um, and then end up in, in bodies of water. And I think there's been a lot of work outside of Lake Natoma. Um, for uh, impacts associated with uh, what, what gets put into waterways. Um, and so we worked with uh, one of the researchers um, at UC Riverside, uh, Dr. Gann again, on residue testing of what's in catch basins. Um, so we looked at various uh, bottled bioassays, um, making sure that our products are going to be uh, useful um, and still work. Um, so we do bottle bioassays to make sure that our products are still going to be effective um, against the mosquito because the problem associated with these pesticide levels or pesticide residues that are in these catch basins is that they build up resistance to the mosquito that we're trying to kill. So um, if somebody is overspraying um, or homeowners are overspraying and that material is getting into the catch basin, then the mosquito has an uh, um, uh, exposure to that and then they start to build up resistance. And then when we try to, um, to kill them for public health and disease, um, then our products are less effective. Uh, we also worked with uh, um, uh, a professor out of UC Davis, uh, medical entomology. He was looking at uh, uh, genomes of mosquitoes um, and specifically looking at insecticide resistance genes. Um, so again, doing bottle bioassays of these uh, mosquitoes to make sure that our products are still gonna work. And he's tracking and doing um, the actual genetic testing on some of these mosquitoes. Um, so here's some of the work that we're doing out in the field in terms of resistance testing. Uh, we have mosquitoes in those little cages and then we'll spray a material across and then we'll gauge as to how effective our materials uh, were with both uh, truck and aerial types of applications. Um, here's another one a project that we worked on. This is called sugar wicks. And so uh, all mosquitoes need uh, sugar or nectar to try to, to live on. And so we would plant these, um, uh, we would uh, dip these wicks into sugar, into a sugar solution and then put them out there. And, uh, and then when the mosquitoes would come to feed on those sugar wicks, they essentially, they kind of spit back up into the sugar wick. And so then we essentially have DNA of the mosquito. Uh, so then we could take those sugar wicks, we could take them back to our office and run them through the PCR and actually find if there's virus um, in, their, um, in their expectorate. So um, kind of a new and innovative, innovative way of looking at uh, virus uh, surveillance. So, Essentially, what do we ask uh, the public to do? Um, all of this, we have what we call seven Ds. Uh, drain standing water on your property. Make sure you're not breeding any mosquitoes. Uh, dawn and dusk are times to avoid being outdoors. That's when mosquitoes tend to be most active and that's when they're gonna be looking for a blood meal. Um, they don't like this hot weather, so they kind of hunker down until it gets a little bit cooler. Uh, if you do have to go outside, dress in long sleeves um, and pants when you're outside. Um, I know that's a challenge in the, in the heat of summer sometimes. Um, defend yourself with a good repellent. So we, uh, we actually sell or not sell, but hand out, uh, we buy uh, repellent by the, by the pallet. Uh, we've got tens of thousands of repellent packets. If you need them, give us a call. We'd be more than happy to, um, to give them away. We want people to use them. So we tend to give them out at events and things like that. Um, but if there's any avenues that you guys can think of, we're more than happy to deliver some, uh, and then you can uh, help us distribute that uh, repellent to the public. Uh, doors and screens should be in good working order. So I know in the summertime, we always wanna try to get that Delta breeze come through. Um, the challenge with that is that mosquitoes are small and they pick up your carbon dioxide that you exhale. And so when you exhale that carbon dioxide, that's how they know that there's a, a blood source. Um, and so they find that. So if your screens and doors are not in good working order, then mosquitoes get in and they find you while you're sleeping. Um, and then the last D is district personnel are here to help. So all you have to do is give us a call, let us know that you're experiencing problems associated with mosquitoes. 
um, that you, you know, that you're seeing mosquitoes, you're being bothered or that somebody has a bad pool or whatever that may be. Uh, we typically come out within 24 hours to try to assess the situation um, and let you know what it is that we can do and what we found. So um, with that, you can get more information. Um, uh, there's our phone number and our website is uh, fightthebite.net. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Gary. That was a, a, a great presentation. It's uh, you're perfecting it from year to year and it's getting more and more comprehensive. So, so thank you very much. Are there any comments for questions from the commissioners? Okay. I have, I have one that's not really uh, related to mosquitoes, but it's uh, uh, in 2017, the commission uh, 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 coordinated with uh, the environmental management department and hoped that uh, there would be some kind of communications with your department to look at hazardous algal blooms that you may encounter while your people are in the field. Is that coordination still going ongoing or have you had any uh, discussions about that this year? Uh, no, we haven't had a discussion th uh, this year, but you're right. We, we started those negotiations and, and because we have folks that are out in the field, uh, when we did find, so we did do a training. In fact, they came out and did training with our staff to be able to try to find what to look for. Um, and that's part of our annual training program, even for the seasonals that we come through. We talk about those algal blooms um, as to what to kind of look for. And if we do find it, then we have a contact information to be able to try to, uh, um, to pass that information on. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any questions? I have a from question. The yeah, Laura, I have a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you, um, if there are ducks or other birds, wild birds that would eat mosquito larvae and egg rafts and things that you. Um, the, the short answer is sure. Um, I mean, you know, uh, not necessarily really ducks. I mean, they may, as they're kind of filtering through, uh, they may collect some, and that might be fine. But that's not exactly their like their main source. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people talk about are bats, right? Bats can eat their weight in mosquitoes, right? They can eat a thousand mosquitoes a night. Um, the challenge with that, and the answer is they can, absolutely. And so similar with small, other smaller birds, would they eat mosquitoes if available? Sure, the answer is absolutely. Um, but that's not necessarily a prime diet aspect of it. And so uh, the example that I give with the bat, you know, we have one of our largest populations of mosquitoes um, underneath the causeway. And as you know, underneath the causeway, there's a huge bat colony. <laughs> so um, the problem with, the, I think, with those types of things is that, you know, bat, everybody is opportunistic. So if the bat is looking at its radar screen, you know, it's, its radar that it's putting out and it sees a mosquito on one side and then a nice big moth on the other side, it's going to go towards the moth. And so there's been a lot of uh, studies um, specifically for bats on, um, on what their diet is. And while mosquitoes are a part of that, um, they're not a large portion of their of their diet, unless that's the only thing available, um, because it's just too much effort to be able to try to get the, you know, the same weight of mosquitoes as you would in that in that nice moth. And for the most part, you know, we all try to be efficient when we're eating. <laughs> and, and the second question that I had was this SIT program where you're sterilizing males seems like such a no brainer, safe thing, um, other than educating the public, which I would think would understand immediately what the goal is here. What, what are the downsides? Like what kind of resistance are you guys running into for something like that? Um, for the most part, I think it, it's, it, I think it is, it's education. It's, you know, it, I think when you have an opportunity and I think we see this throughout the, through, throughout everything that we do, when you have an opportunity to sit down and talk with somebody for five minutes about the science and the technology and what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, I think you can get that, that, that message across. Unfortunately, I think what happens is that um, people kind of jump to conclusions. Um, I know the Florida Keys was dealing with a similar situation and the fact that they were then, you know, the, the media, and I don't want to blame the media, but um, the opponents were coming out and saying, well, these are Franken, we don't want to be guinea pigs. Um, these are Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein mosquitoes. Um, and so they, they started doing a, a fear tactics associated with the general public. Um, so I think the challenge is being able to try to help educate. And that's what we're, that's what we've been doing. Actually, for the last year and a half, we've been trying to put out social media articles, talk with our elected officials, talk about this type of technology and show how effective it is. Because I think you're right. When you look at it and you say, well, male mosquitoes don't bite. So there's no risk of disease transmission associated with this. Um, all they're going to do is mate with these invasive mosquitoes that we don't want that potentially can transmit disease. And then the population crashes and then we have less of an issue. It does. There is no real downside um, from that. But people, 
um, kind of jump to conclusions and terms. So I think our, our big challenge is really just trying to get the public to understand what it is that we're doing. And we're, we're trying to put more information on our website. In fact, our statewide and national associations are trying to develop, you know, talking points and videos and things like that that can help explain it to, to the public in very simple terms so that they have an understanding of where the science is coming from. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the fact that this technology has been around for decades and used very effectively in a lot of different areas, it makes a lot of sense. So these people in Florida that were creating fear, are they saying, you know, by all any, any and all bioengineering is bad kind of a thing? I mean, is that kind what of. their argument was? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, the hard part is, I, you know, you get these small populations or these fringe groups, and sometimes they're the loudest. And, and they when they're the loudest, noise. then, yeah. you know, they, they, get the, they get the attention. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. We appreciate your time on this, and we hope to see you again next year. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day. Appreciate the invitation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, agenda item is to approve our March uh, meeting minutes. Uh, we'll skip that item since we don't have a quorum tonight, and we'll take that up uh, at our next meeting. Uh, the next item is any, any report backs from the commissioners regarding environmental issues from the sponsoring agencies that we've been monitoring. Has anybody, I think, a report that's uh, a um, This is Eric. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't get to sit in on the Elk Grove April uh, meeting, but I do plan to, I'll report on that next time. I did want to say that um, SMUD, which is the one of the agencies that I'm following, released their um, absolute zero clean energy vision plan. So they're planning to go to absolute zero by 2030, which I believe is the most aggressive uh, goal in, in the entire maybe the world. I, I know for, for sure it's California, but, but one of the most aggressive plans that I've heard uh, released uh, anywhere. So just wanted to report out on that. There's information on the website if you're, if you're interested. Okay. Anything else to report? Um, I, I, I saw that the City of Sacramento Law and Legislative Committee uh, is moving forward to adopt, uh, 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 I guess, code, building codes that will uh, allow the, um, uh, require the electrification of new construction in the city. So you're getting rid of all natural gas and other forms of energy other than electricity. And it's too obviously to uh, reduce greenhouse gas impacts. The, the main, one of the more vocal opponents to this is the restaurant industry because they don't believe that uh, electricity is sufficiently hot enough to generate heat for cooking in a restaurant environment. So they actually, but they probably do have a uh, complaint that's valid, but it's, it's kind of contrary to the direction where the city is going at this point in time. Um, then in the uh, Sacramento Planning Commission, uh, they are just now in the process of publishing an environmental justice element report card. And uh, this is a, uh, an ongoing effort where they're uh, 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 developing an environmental justice element to the general plan. And this process, uh, they reported through this report card of how they're doing to achieve that. So it's out there on the web and uh, it has several uh, items that they are undertaking to uh, make this go forward. But other than that, that's all I was able to locate. I've got a couple items. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, I, uh, um, SMUD's got a regional trail survey out, which is part of the um, connecting the, the area with trails. Rails to Trails is another group that, that does that. And yeah, they put a survey out. I took the survey and I suggest if you, know, if you guys want to do it, do the same thing. You know, uh, get some walking trails in here. I'm sure it's probably uh, going to percolate some grants of, uh, in the future. And then I attended the uh, Consumedness Sub Basin Groundwater Sustainability Plan meeting, which was an interesting meeting. And it's a series of meetings. I believe they're having another one later this month. And, uh, Another workshop, I think, or, uh, another work, or a workshop next month too. And it involves, finally, I've been asking about our groundwater and our groundwater availability since at least 1989. And 
finally the state tree, the state got involved and is finally requiring these uh, water survey providers to to uh, put groundwater plants in place and actually map your your aquifers. So the consumerist group is actually made up of seven agencies. It was a good meeting. There was over a hundred people in the attendance, by the way. Hey, let me see, City of Gaul, what are they doing? Uh, well, yeah, political landmines. Uh, Gaul market community plan presentation for the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, there may be down the road, um, maybe a, one big EIR for the whole project, or there may be multiple EIRs for the different five phases. I don't know, but they're just now starting that process. They're in the middle of updating the uh, draft uh, housing element, which uh, again may or may not involve an update to the EIR for the, for the uh, general plan. Uh, they also uh, have a grant that they're working on a uh, Carillion Boulevard corridor plan to actually reduce that from the, from the current four lanes to two lanes. And that uh, they just uh, went through that, I think, uh, last week. And that was uh, done with a mitigated big deck, which means basically it didn't rise to the level of a EIR or environmental impact report. Isle 10, what are they doing? Let me see. Uh, on their uh, agenda, they've got a cannabis buffer zone amendment. They're always fun. They have a minor rezone uh, for an educational park, and get this, in the commercial zone, which is an interesting place for a park, if you think about it. And then uh, let me see, just regular business after that. Uh, city of Folsom, the only uh, item of City of Folsom other than regular business was uh, once again, they were recognized by the uh, Arbor Day Foundation as a, uh, tree, a USA tree city. So congratulations, Folsom. That's it. Okay, good, thanks. Um, moving on, uh, Marie, uh, you wanna give us your management department's report, please. Um, yes, um, one item is uh, our fee package is scheduled to go to the board on May the 4th, um, where, I, where I will be presenting and We've almost completed our outreach. Um, we have one more board member to meet with. And Jill, there was three more presentations for PBIDs that you were outreaching to, Fulton Avenue PBID and the Watt I-80. Were those completed? Yes, those are completed and also Sunrise Marketplace. Okay. Oh, the Antelope Business Community District. Yes, yeah, so we it's pretty comprehensive. The board members seemed happy of all the outreach that we did do. We had to do it twice because of the pandemic. We started in 19. We're, we're supposed to go to the board in March of 2020. Um, pandemic broke out, so we pulled the item and we ended up extending our schedule for one year but it's going to expire at the end of June. And we received that letter from you. So we showed the board members um, your letter of support also. So things seem to be going okay. The other item is we're being invited. Um, City of Sacramento wanted us to look at a shelter that they wanted to expand. They're looking to establish more safe encampments for homeless. So there was one on, I think it's on Meadowview. So they asked us to go there with a team to assess, can they expand it? And CDC put out guidelines for shelters. So we shared that document with them, but there's a myriad of questions, right? How many porta potties? You can't become your own water drinking water system. Um, and, and how do they handle the food? So. Anyway, it seems like there seems to be more efforts in trying to find um, safe or create safe homeless encampments for the homeless. Is that going to become a permanent uh, location or is this a, just a temporary location? 
I don't know. Um, I have two managers going out on Wednesday, so they'll report back. Exactly. They, they invited the county, but this is actually a city um, shelter. So I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about that as it develops. Yeah, there was, I did see an article where the mayor was asking each city council member in the city of Sacramento to find a location to establish a safe encampment. Okay. You know, I, I've got a little experience with the homeless because Tom, you're muted. Yeah, I'm muted. I've got a little experience with the homeless, uh, you know, based on my city experience. And uh, one of the main issues we found, found is that uh, the homeless don't want to go to those places. They want to, I mean, talk about independence. They are really, really independent. Uh, we found that a lot of them have two or three campsites. So if you if you clean up one campsite, they'll, they'll just migrate to another one. Um, they're real good at finding property where you 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 can't clean it up, uh, such as they've got a little spot here under the railroad. Well, the railroad controls that. Neither county does. So it's a, it's an agency. You know what do you do? And we have a, a, one of our police officers goes out every week and meets with all of our homeless people and everything else and offers them assistance, where they can go, what they can do, where they can take a shower or get clothes or eat or whatever. And most of them decline. And I, so it, it, there's a problem that a lot of people aren't aware of. It's, it's a, there's you know, a lot of issues, but let's yeah, just there's a lot of issues, no issues. The environmental side of the things here for our purposes tonight. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of mental, mental and drug issues uh, to contend with. You know, and then again, uh, with the uh, Boise, Idaho case, uh, they have every right to sleep on the sidewalk out in front of your house, too, if there's no other place in town for them to sleep. So what will happen by setting up a site like this is now they'll have a place that they, the city has designated they can go to. If they choose not to, what do you do? You can't arrest them, but I don't think that's a viable solution. So it's it's a... <laughs> The issue is bigger than we are, I'll tell you that. Very happy to contribute to um, the project though, Marie. You said that it sounded like they were looking for extra hands to take a look at the site. Um, I think it was to, to see if they can expand it. Um, mm -hmm. so they wanted us to probably look at, you know, their sanitation setup and, you know, maybe food. Um, there was a guidance document put out, I think it's by CDC, that had the COVID mitigation measures uh, incorporated in that guidance document. So we sent it to them, but they asked us to come out there on Wednesday. So um, I'll know more once my managers get out there. Okay, yeah, I'd be very happy to do that. So um, please do keep me in the loop. Okay. Okay, um, our next item is commissioner comments. Uh, I'll start it up with a couple of things here. Uh, we received a draft natural resources management plan from the regional parks department for the American River Parkway. And Jill forwarded that to everybody uh, during the past week, 10 days or so. And included in that package was a, a summary of the, plan, of the resources management plan and some comments that I had made on the plan itself. And hopefully everybody had a chance to take a look at it. And if you have any edits or comments on those, on all those comments, uh, we'd like to get them into us as soon as possible. And if there's no objection from the commissioners, we'd like to forward these comments to regional parks right away. And uh, we can't wait till next month because the comment period will be expired and that'll be the end of that opportunity. So. Uh, is there anybody who had any objections to the comments that were presented to there, or is there any major concerns that you'd like to voice at this point in time? Well, since I, since we don't have uh, the opportunity to 
respond as a commission, by putting it on the agenda and, and doing it that way. Um, if we respond, it would be as an individual. Uh, well, I'm asking that if there's no objection, that we submit it as a commission. I don't have an objection. I did participate in the survey and I am in support of the comments. That, that, that's what I'd like to say. Okay, great. No objections for me either. Okay. Right. I, I don't have any objections. objections. Uh, my concern would be, again, is this not a, an agendized item? So would it, you know, again, would, you know, I, I agree with your comments and I don't have a problem submitting them. It's just I'm, I'm, my concern is that, you know, without it being on the agenda, as an agenda as the item, I'm not sure how that plays out as doing it as a commission. Okay. We can all agree that, you know, uh, individually, we all agree with you, Richard. Do it individually. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll take that in consideration and I'll, and I'll discuss it further with Mark. Um, uh, there was a couple of things. Once is um, I received a uh, email from the city of Sacramento called the City Minute. I'm not sure if we all received that or if it's just me, but there was a, uh, a good discussion today about the city's actions uh, regarding um, uh, um, what they're doing for uh, uh, environment. Uh, excuse me, uh, climate change planning and uh, uh, other actions. And so I forwarded the email to Jill and she's, I asked her to forward it to you guys. And so you can take a look at it and maybe get on that email list to see if there's anything further that uh, uh, we wanna you know, just partake in and, and, and monitor as time goes on. Uh, Recently, we received an email from uh, the public, uh, a, a woman named Angelina Chiam, who's a uh, at Natoma Pacific Pathways Prep High School. And she is asking us uh, that we would be a perfect entity to uh, uh, encourage uh, local uh, uh, agencies and authorities to, again, uh, uh, reduce the use of plastic bags and uh, re-implement uh, 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 one-use bags that are from the grocery stores. And she recognizes that that whole thing fell apart during the COVID crisis because of sanitary concerns. And so I was going to uh, respond back to Angelina and inform her of our past actions to encourage uh, the reduction of uh, plastic bags in the, in the city and the county and inform her that, yeah, we'd be happy to uh, 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 support her, her, her involvement, but we still have to be recognizing public health concerns and we, uh, especially during this time of the, the COVID uh, uh, epidemic or pandemic. So I just wanted to inform you of that. Uh, finally, the last thing on my agenda is that this Thursday is Earth Day. And in the past, we have, as a commission, taken sometimes taken actions and sometimes we haven't. But I think because of our inability to communicate on a regular basis, is we haven't really thought about it this year. So maybe um, uh, for next year, we can form a subcommittee or at least uh, some, if there's any interest to put together something that's more a little formal and uh, recognizes the efforts of our sponsoring agencies on behalf of uh, what their activities they're doing. Any other comments from the commissioners? Well, uh, seeing none or hearing none. Uh, well, I got one quick comment about Earth Day. I can remember, <laughs> I'm dating my dead self, uh, that uh, the commission, when Sacramento State used to have a big Earth Day event, the Sacramento Environmental Commission would actually present their uh, environmental awards at that event. Correct. So it's just something to think about, maybe, you know, for the future. 
You're exactly right, Tom. Uh, we used to do it there, but we we migrated to the uh, to the city council meetings, and then this year we had nothing. So it's maybe something to plan for uh, over the next year to see if we can organize something like that. Uh, that's as far as I have. I think we've met our completed our agenda, so I think we'll just uh, close the meeting. And uh, next meeting will be held on May 17th, and it'll be conducted via Zoom. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Great to see Have you. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.